des chefs de Pink Floyd avec Rick Wright, organiste, Roger Water, bassiste et Nick Mason, batteur. Hello and welcome to a new edition of the Fingal's Cave podcast. I'm Phil Salate and our guest today is Ron Giesen, whose work and storied career will certainly be familiar to our listeners. Ron is a composer, musician, and author, among many other things. His wide-ranging discography includes a number of film scores, including the soundtrack to The Body, which he created with Roger Waters. Ron famously collaborated with Pink Floyd, bringing his compositional art and his craft to bear on the title track to the album Adam Hart Mother. He wrote a marvelous book about this experience called The Flaming Cow. Joining me as well is Nils St. Fenich, co-founder and producer of the Fingal's Cave podcast. Welcome, Ron, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, hello to you. Yes. So hi, one great. Of the... hi, hi, Ron. It's great to have you. Hi. Hello. So yeah, it's... I, I, you know that all of us composers, of which I am one, are, 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 are good-natured egotists. So I want to talk a little bit about me because it connects to something I think that in your, in your history. Um, I went to Bennington College, um, which, as you may know, was where um, uh, Désert by Varese, a piece that I think is dear to your heart, was actually premiered, although I was negative 20 years old, so I wouldn't have been able to attend the premiere. And my teacher would... Yeah, oh, it's, isn't it? I mean, my, my favorite of his is Ante Graal. I love that, you know, the sort of snarling, you know, the trombone and the high clarinet, but that's, that's a marvelous piece. And um, I was very lucky to have a teacher named Stephen Siegel, and Stephen was half... Uh, Romanian, Romanian Jewish and half Scottish. And he drew very heavily on his Scottish ancestry in his teaching. Um, I mean, he also loved Wagner. Uh, I have very fond memories of harmony classes where, we, where we'd go from learning to harmonize McCrimmon's Lament or the Sky Boat Song. And then all of a sudden he'd put on a, a, a Valkyrie helmet and start lustily playing at the piano. So, you know, very, very different from, I think, stiff academia. And so one of the first things I wanted to ask you was, um, how do you think your own Scottish heritage informs your music and your approach to music? <laughs> uh, I think the, f the first answer to that is not at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe the, uh, not in, not in, the, in a direct musical sense, but possibly in a, in a sense of humor and, hmm absurdity um, and you see I mean I, I am a, I'm a mixture of paradoxes um, I can be very very um, obtuse and go into corners of detail and then and then suddenly I just come out with a wow that's that and that's that bang you know and, and make a direct statement um, I suppose I mean, possibly my reaction, my reaction to being brought up in middle class Lanarkshire in the nineteen fifties, that's pro that would have fed in to what I did later. There's no doubt about that. Um, the the I felt completely stifled. Uh, and I had very little um, relationship with the environment, the, the the steel and the coal mining part of the industry that was in Lanarkshire, which is just south of Glasgow, for those that are not in that country. Um, and uh, so I er erupted. So my sense of, the, certainly in live performance when of which I've done many, but stopped two, two three years ago. Um, my, my, the, the, the live performances are a direct reaction, a, a, a total ex explosion of emotion, <laughs> uh, uh, an exorcising of passion. Um, and so that all feeds in, I think, yes. But mm -hmm. no direct musical, no, no musical... Um, connection, not like <laughs> you know. Do I play the bagpipes? Certainly not. <laughs> do, <laughs> and it, do I have a Scottish accent? Yes, um, <laughs> but I think that I re I, I believe um, it, 
looking back, that I retained my Scottish accent to cut through noisy audiences. Like, I get that, I not get <laughs> You know, um, and you've, if you've seen Billy, you know, the, the famous comedian Billy Connolly, you'll see that that works usually in in foreign countries to Australia and South Africa, wherever. Um, yeah, so I, because I'm not, in some ways, I'm not a musician. Um, I paint, I've always said I, I paint with sound. I, I, I use a palette of sound to, to construct things. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes uh, the, my, some, some of my work can, can come out as very non-musical. It can come out as four people shouting or um, mutter, you know, international language. Which I enjoy very much to do. So there, I, I think that'll do about that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I wish I, I wish you could have met Stephen because I think the two of you uh, would have a lot in common. He actually um, was a photographer, and I've not, I noticed that when you were in some of your comments to that famous concert in two thousand eight, um, you mentioned that you think of the piano keyboard almost more in visual terms rather than kind of pre-hearing, you know, everything you're going to play. Instead, of, you, you see patterns and you see the yeah. ways in which the the keyboard reveals that to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think that. T- uh, well, let me put it that creativity is a method of forming external models of one's brain, of one's thinking process, not one's brain in, the, in a physical sense, but the, the, the electrochemical um, gyrations that go on in the human brain. I think that we have the as artists, if we're doing a good job for ourselves, we we, uh, we present these patterns of the brain. And the more that you can suspend the conscious, I think the better the work will be. Uh, I know that an awful lot of um, people, composers and people, art artists in the past and probably in the present have taken to um, artificial substances, um, vi- <laughs> drugs and alcohol to, in order to allow that subconscious flow. But I can, uh, I found that I can do it, just sit down at a piano and that's it, it comes out. Um, okay, it, it can only come back come out on the piano um, but it uh, it's a method for improvising uh, for me is a method of of uh, exercising the mind and here we are fairly uh, <laughs> some people <laughs> some people think I'm oh this is something I've ri- I have written because I've also written a book of, of my collected writer well, I've collected <laughs> my writings in a book called The Stapled Brain and um, one piece is an early piece I used to do on stage uh, uh, which goes some people say I'm mad but I say I'm a lot more mad than that which brings (laughs) me back round to the front of the extremely sane okay (laughs) there you go Oh. It's all fun, I tell you. It's all fun if you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know, you yeah, came up. You, you you came of age at a, in a very interesting time um, because I mean, we we, we were you sort of alluded to your spoken word pieces um, earlier, and uh, I, some of our listeners, you know, may know something like, uh, and I don't know if you know actually, Kurt Schwitter's Ursanat, that that piece that you know with a rocket base say oomph. Have you ever heard that one? No, but oh, it's it, great fun. It, it, well, it ties up. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. it ties up with the it, with the international language. Yes, 
And the idea of, of phonemes expressing something rather than just their literal meaning also being, you know, potentially pure sound or kind of evoking sound, uh, evoking things rather than denoting them. I yes, guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, yes, I, it's a kind of Western example, maybe, I'm thinking aloud now, um, as I do. Uh, it's it's a, of the of the the Indian classical m music um, phonetics that you know when they do the they speak the tabla, <laughs> the, the the tabla players can 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 do a, a voice impression of of what they do and in fact it, it, it I believe it is a method of teaching to you know and you could so once you've got that rhythm or a, or a sense of flow of rhythm there you can you put any sounds onto it which is correct which is where the Schwitters is coming from and there was a chap in um, well there were a couple of people in England in the early 60s uh, sound poets. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was, I, there was one fella called Bob Cobbing. I, I remember him. I knew him. Um, ra ta 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 ta. Ra ta ta. Ra ra ta 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 ta. Ra ta ta ra ra. Ta. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just used to fall about, you know, because it was so fun. They took it so seriously, and you know I can just do it. With, and and laugh as well, <laughs> but anyway, that's the point. Listen, there's so much bloody p nonsense in the world, and and idiots killing each other, and um, and and religious persecution, and all the rest of it. That we've got to rem maintain our sense of humour, which I, I believe that one of the, <laughs> I think one of the reasons why we get this. British Isles is getting so many um, immigrants. <laughs> it's because they want to. They want to have some sense of humour. They're coming for. <laughs> they're not coming. For, uh, they're actually also coming for the, the free medical service, <laughs> the NHS, National Health Service. Um, but I think they're, they're coming for the sense of humour, because it's always been here. And, and I, yeah. that's the thing I've been thinking about a lot, actually, uh, as I prepared for today, that you know, between some things that you've said and just listening with fresh ears, I wonder whether people have often failed to pick up on what I'm now realizing is a lot of humor in Adam Hart Mother specifically. Like, in other words, you know, I, I, I think people took it very, very straight. And obviously there's parts of it that are that are conceived as sort of explicitly lyrical and beautiful. Um, but I'm wondering whether people have under recognized the humor um, in it or or perhaps I'm completely wrong, but I'm, I'm excited to find out one way or the other. Yeah, well, well, you 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 you, you said before we started that you you have read the read the book mm -hmm. uh, of my book, The Flaming Cow. And um, so you, you would you will know um, where I've um, played with <laughs> With the backing track, the the Floyd backing track, uh, and, and and played with meaning have fun with. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, there is there's definitely humour in there. Well, there's the, and also there's the phonetic uh, um, voice section, you know, the choir section. The, um, and people say, people have asked me, in all seriousness, does it mean a, does it mean anything, Mister Keeson? <laughs> no, it's just me having fun. Um, what I do is, you know, uh, but but I've said that, 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 that to have fun is to have life. There, yeah, you can write that one down. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's right. interesting. The um, the Ultimate Mother piece is um, for me a very personally a very important uh, piece of music because uh, this is the first thing I listened to when I was a child. I was I was uh, not only on this earth uh, when it came out, but uh, when I was about three or four years old, my parents had the LP, and uh, I had e even the cow on the front scared me already. And then the beginning, the the motor bicycle driving away the fanfare and and 
the police sound and everything for me it was very dark i had a very i was four years old three or four years old and had a very <laughs> concrete story about it it was some robbery going on and he was fleeing and the police went after him so in the beginning for me it was personally very dark but also very strange and then i stopped listening to pink floyd when i was six whatever of course i didn't listen to it but then when I was about 14 or 15, I, I listened to it again and, and literally cried because it was so deep, emotionally so deep, because it was part of my first memories and childhood. And I think that might be a reason why, uh, at least for me personally, why uh, Atomic Mother seems a bit dark and even sad, because the beginning is, to me at least, and maybe I'm totally wrong here, but is very dark and very strange and deep and everything yeah well uh, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> yes and so, and so is life um, uh, <laughs> what should I say no I, I, I mean obviously there's a, the obvious drone the obvious drone and then my my Antip antipathetic drone going against their drone um, I suppose you, what, if one could take it but that, that's the fascinating thing about about music that, <laughs> what I've always mu music and organised noise um, I've always uh, thought it or described it as the, the invisible force it gets at you and it comes under doors it, it comes through walls you know you can't have pictures coming through walls you, you can only <laughs> sound come through um and uh if if you are of a, if you have a certain recept a certain set of receptors in your head then you're going to interpret i mean i think that's the great thing you know, I mean, I, I, I'll give you an instance. I, I made a, uh, I made an album of of um, uh, um, sound. If, what's it called? Electro sound for uh, music library, music library album for KPM, um, right? Yeah, yeah, at KPM. And there's one piece in there called Single Pot, which is a, a play upon. The, the manipulation of potentiometers to uh, achieve very complex rhythms and um, I just made it as a pattern as a thing uh, and I was sitting at watching the television one night and uh, there it was as a background for a little beetle in the desert digging a hole <laughs> <laughs> and it was fantastic and I, con I contacted the, the the director later on and and we became great friends and because I wanted to find out what he how he had interpreted the difference of my interpretation and his inter and that's the fun the fun you know you, you well what I've always said you, you throw things up out into space or like leaves blowing off a tree and some of them will fly and others will end up sodden in the gutter wet and, and flushed away uh, and if if you're too sensitive <laughs> you get worried about the ones that get flushed away but it's inevitable so the people's interpretation is actually a, a, a thing of great um, uh, enjoyment to me you know and, uh, <laughs> and people having, having, the, well, they're impo We impose our impressions of things in that sense, on on music, and and, uh, and that's the, that's part of the dialogue actually between the the isolated composer and the the more um, liberated consumer. You know, that's, there's a lot to might be said about that. Anyway, that'll do. <laughs> that'll <laughs> and do. In case any of our listeners don't know, uh, 
KPM was a label uh, around since I think the late 60s, which specialized. My understanding is that composers would, um, and 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 you know, peop, all all kinds of people who made sound would would put together an album's worth of material, and then it would be licensed by television programs, by movies, by all sorts of things, as as cues or as soundtrack music or whatever they might need. Um, and you and you did I think just was it two albums for KPM, Electro Sound and Electro Sound Volume Two? Do I have it right? Yeah, uh, there's a th- there's a third one, um, but it wasn't a vinyl. It was a CD. Oh, it's a CD. And it was a, a an associated label. It's all the same. Mm-hmm. It, it it's it, it's a library. One is contributing to a library of possible pieces that can be used by anyone. I mean, they might mm-hmm. only take five seconds out of a piece, or they might use the whole piece. I mean, on the on the sleeve notes to to the, the first the electro sound, the first one, I said it, w- it would not be wrong to play things backwards and at the wrong speed. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, just just take it and use it for God's sake. Uh, <laughs> as the uh, there was a, um, a, a, a no, what was he? He was a. A, a, an agent, a music, a musical uh, agent, interviewed on the on a television documentary once, and he's, he he led, he was leaning over the um, the fence to on the the Thames, opposite the Houses of Parliament, and he turned to the camera and he said, "Art for art's sake, money for Christ's sake." <laughs> <laughs> You know, and and Coleman, you might know the the name, having having been or you still potentially are a jazz musician, uh, Coleman Hawkins, the of great, course, yeah. the, the inventor of the tenor saxophone, um, uh, the jazz tenor saxophone. Anyway, um, he's re- reputed to have said, uh, usually, "Where's the stage? Where's the audience? Where's the money?" And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would add, and the rest was genius. <laughs> right. Oh. Do you know his um his sax solo on Epistrophe when he plays with Thelonious Monk? It's one of my favorite solos by anyone. Uh, no, I, no, I, I mean I've got it. Mm-hmm. I've got it, but I I haven't. Um, I'd have to go and and recall it. Um, <laughs> no, I. I I did a six-part series on Coleman Hawkins for radio, BBC, the classical radio station Radio Three, uh, some years ago, where I took his his whole creative life apart in, the, in all the different facets and uh, really went in in depth. And I've got, uh, yeah, I've got, th- I must have thousands of record. I've got a lot of original seventy-eights of uh, of Hawkins. And it, including an unissued take. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, a, a, a one-off um, ma- master. It was a master pressing. It was a seventy-eight master pressing of one of the last pieces he made in America before he came across to uh, Europe in thirty, th- late thirty-three, thirty, nineteen thirty-four. Anyway. Oh wow! <laughs> it sends me. Is it? It sends me. Look it has it and, has that ever come out on CD or anything like that, or no, are you the only? No, oh. no, no, no. <laughs> should should no, we uh, should we put a perimeter? No. <laughs> I was gonna say, should we put a perimeter fence around your property to keep all the jazz record collectors away now? <laughs> oh God, they're horrible. Jazz record collectors hate them. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh. So, uh, except so, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we could go off on a completely different on a tan- There's a tangent we could go off on now. Uh, well, it, it does. Uh, well, sorry, Nils, Nils. Let me let me let you speak first. Yeah. Go on. Um, I had the idea of coming back to the book and and especially on the foreword, um, which um, Nick Mason wrote, and he wrote it very nicely and. It's a funny thing with all these um, interesting people around Pink Floyd I interviewed, all the interviewees were talking about Nick Mason being so nice and great and it's um, he somehow stood out being non-political, being extremely kind and nice and 
looking again at your book, it was, um, I didn't wonder that Nick Mason wrote the foreword. I think who else would have done it but Nick Mason. So how was your relationship with him in the late years? Do you still, are you still in contact with him? Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I can be any time. I could be in contact with any of them any time. But I don't because they, they're, we all live in different, uh, on different clouds, <laughs> mm. on different strata. Um, and uh, no, I, I, I was amazed that he agreed. Cause, you know, after when I asked, I asked him, I said, you know, because of all the things that they had said and thought about this strange piece. Um, whether he would do that, and he did. But that's that's him. He is. That's who he is. He, a nice. He's a very nice chap. But there were. <laughs> you see, we were all brought up in middle class middle class families with good education, <laughs> whatever that means. I mean, you know, I thought, having said good education, I could also say that. <laughs> there is life after school and just remember that you go out you, it's a bit like um, passing your driving test you, 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 you pass your driving test and then you go out and learn how to drive you know in the real Absolutely. world um, and I think the same is true of school uh, but anyway there you go mm -hmm. yes a very nice fellow yes and for, for what it's worth I think you know my generation of professors we've started being much more upfront with students about that. We, we try, you know, we try not to put them in the, oh, now you must go to grad school because that's what one does sort of pipeline. And we try to, yeah, we try to be a little bit more. Um, and I'm quite open with my students about the fact that I deliberately spent quite a bit of time away from academia before going back to it, you know, doing all kinds of things, childcare, you know, uh, working for a I church, do, redoing their hymnal, all, all sorts of things. So, yeah. Oh, I was going to ask him, um, you know, I, I think I've noticed that it's well known to people who, you know, know a bit about the band that Roger and Nick were sort of were close friends and, and the two of them seemed to be on the same wavelength. And and you ended up hanging out a fair bit with them and their wives. And I wonder whether your kind of absurdist sense of humor was one of the things I think that connected the three of you. And I also wonder whether you, like them, grew up listening to The Goon Show at all. Oh, yes. Oh, the, no, the, the Goon Show, I, before, long before I left Scotland, left home in Scotland, um, I used to take the, the wireless, <laughs> the so-called wireless, the radio, which is actually a, a, a wire full, because it's full of wires. Um, I used to take that under the bedclothes with, with the valves gl with lighting <laughs> lighting up under the bedclothes to listen to the goon show yes that it was a whole world and it, it, it a lot of that surreal humor it, it comes out in my stuff yeah well some of my stuff anyway yeah, yeah. So I, I, absolutely yeah when I when I talk about a composer's work with students, one of the things they often want to know is, you know, sort of how do they how do they get into the the narrative you might call it of that person's work. Uh, I think the more connections we perceive, the easier it is to really feel as though we've tuned into that person's wavelength. And um, I wonder, I listened to the concert from two thousand eight the other night, and when I try to hear connections to what you did in Adam Hart Mother to your other music. A very facile one I could make is, is, is listening to Brass Course. I mean, it's on the same program, right? It uses similar forces. But I wonder from your point of view, what, you know, when you think about what you did um, for Adam Hart Mother, um, you know, your, your, your compositional contributions, they were very circumscribed, of course, because the band already had this structure. Although, as you discussed in The Flaming Cow, you liked working under structures because they really do, it really does focus the mind. And as, as a fellow composer, I can say it does the same thing for me too. But if I, if I had a student who said, you know, wow, I've listened to the quartet version and I've listened to the, 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 the studio recording or the performance from 2008 and wow, you know, what Ron Giesen did with this skeletal material and how he flushed it out, I really love it. You know, tell me, what should I listen to by him next? 
what would you what, what should I point the student to? What would make, what would be the easiest? What's the what's the what's the next step in their gateway drug, so to speak? In the... There's no. Uh, <laughs> I notice you used the word easiest and and <laughs> and paused quick or, or arrested yourself. We might edit that one out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you see, I would go the other way. You want you don't want to recommend the the easiest. You want to recommend the most difficult. Um, deep end of the pool, huh? Yeah, oh, throw yeah. them throw them into the no, deep no, end absolutely. of the pool. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, God, no, that, that, do you know, that's a question I might, I might have wanted to be written down earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one, the one question, um, oh, listen, any of the, I'm, you know, the, what, the, the CD that sold the least <laughs> is called Blue Fuse, um, which was my attempt at blowing the fuse on a few blues and uh, blue fuse mm -hmm. um, using blues form and taking it into the upper atmosphere somewhere um, and and all the different and you and all different keys and all that kind of stuff um, and listen anything mm -hmm. <laughs> listen to anything from from the crazy that from the opening um piece on a raise of eyebrows which is some uh, my impression of a of a, a bunch of uh, of uh, asylum mental asylum inmates breaking glass <laughs> to a flute to a flute solo, wherever there's a flute solo, or a, a, a nice melody, um, the the, uh, the 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 melody is actually it's a melody on um, on electro sound, and it's called "Song of the Wire." Uh, is it, because I've done an awful lot of what I think are good melodies, but. It, you know, interesting. They obviously, they shift. They shift tonality frequently, um, but they're still melodies. Um, mm. So there's that range of of the total total uproar um, to uh, to a simple melody, and the, and also the, the live performances on the CD. Um, uh, the, the, all the John Peels, the the, the 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 radio disc jockey John Peel sessions. Um, I for, do you know I've forgotten the name of it. Anyway, the the CD, the double CD, mm -hmm. and there's there's some live pieces on there where I was the guest on a on folk a folk music program. <laughs> and the reason I don't know how. I, that's a whole topic, really. How I got into the contemporary folk scene. Um, is that biting the hand? By the way, is that the name of it? That's it. You've yeah. got it. Okay. You've got it. <laughs> but that's a great this? title. It's, it's a great <laughs> title. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, that's the one. Um, and I play. I, I'm playing with the audience. I mean, it's a live audience, and I break the place apart. And I don't know how why I did it. that was that is an example of pure subconscious flow because when I went on, I had no idea what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. I just started, and I, I and I just I did that. I have to tell you that I don't know if you, you know this, but this one, but I used that technique to to open for the Genesis to tour in 74 um, to promote their album I think it's selling England by the pound of them. and the first gig was in Glasgow and I thought I'm going to start by not starting I'm going to go out in a white coat and look like I'm a, a, an attendant a, a, an assistant to organise a few things that, you know move the hi-hat of the drums or just do stuff and I, I did that and it was entirely the wrong 
way to go and the audience started to erupt and by 20 minutes the whole place was about to be ripped apart by 2,000 angry Scots <laughs> <laughs> and there was nothing I could do about it because I'd blown it I'd totally blown it and I went off <laughs> I managed to, I think just past the 20 minutes and I was you know supposed to do half an hour and uh, and uh, and Pete <laughs> Peter Gabriel was uh, had his face had turned white under his white makeup, <laughs> 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 and the group were about to lynch him, uh, and um, I <laughs> I learned a lot then. Anyway, that, I was engaged to do the tour. It was, it was eighteen dates or something. So the next night in Manchester the Opera House Manchester I went out there and I hit the audience so hard that they couldn't move <laughs> and that was a huge success and the rest of the tour was a great success but that's brinksmanship that's you know unintentional brinksmanship there mm -hmm. to do the, the complete the stupid bugger that I was to do the wrong thing <laughs> but it's that's how you go it's funny because I mean in a way yeah, a couple different bands on either side time-wise of that used to do not not similar things but trying to trigger the audience into rage. I know that Jim Morrison and the Doors back in the late 60s they used to just stop playing and wait and wait and wait and the place would sort of heat up like a pressure cooker. And then Pink Floyd uh -huh. um when they did the Wall tour they actually deliberately sent out somebody out to kind of act the part of the fool and say, you know, are the band ready yet? No, no, not quite yet. And this part, whoever it was would get abuse hurled at them by the crowd and kind of worked up into a frenzy of rage. And then the band would come crashing in, uh, you know, sort of short circuiting right, that. Right, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, right. Now, it's a, yes, it's a technique yeah, that, that one, one you, some people have used, I agree, yes. You have to have a very thick skin though, I think. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yes, but I think the the difference in uh, if you're talking about that the wall, mm -hmm. the 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 audience were all disciples mm -hmm. before they'd started, and that's different. Yeah. When you because you can play with disciples, you can and you can do anything, and they'll go. That's wonderful. Oh, incredible! Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I was, they, they didn't, they wouldn't have, in Glasgow, they would not have known who I was at mm -hmm. that time. Right? That, there's, so there's a, there's a difference. I think m mine was a lot more risky. But anyway, well, never mind. That's well, and it was you. It was you out there instead of a proxy, right? They, it wasn't Roger, you know, Richard, David, and Nick out there getting no, no, bottles yeah, thrown yeah, at yeah, them yeah. or whatever. Um, right. Yeah. So w one thing that you mentioned, um, at one point in the book is that you have this image of the ideal performance of Adam Hart Mother, um, which, you know, three of the four band members are, are at that time are still with us. Rick is obviously gone. Um, mm. And you imagine a choir and a brass section who were fluent in both the classical idiom and in black American forms of expression. And uh, you, do, you have a great turn of phrase. You describe it as the seductive, seductively irregular rhythmic language that's characteristic of black American music. Um, huh. And I wonder if you have there, since the publication of the book, have there been any opportunities to hear the piece played by a, a group like that? Has anything no, materialized? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, uh, no, only the, no, I, <laughs> Um, there was only the, the Paris performance before, um, before well, as to to introduce the piece to the baccalaureate in France, uh, the higher education system, because that the brass was absolutely super, and they were just the top end classical from what the big one of the big orchestras in in Paris. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Someone would have to sort that out in New York to do what 
we're thinking about to have actual black brass players mm-hmm. you know uh, I couldn't sort that out there, there was a, a couple of years ago or actually just before Covid it must be three years ago um, a chap a big promoter from I, I think from the west coast of America um, talked about doing a, a major tour but nothing ever happened, so I don't know what I, I don't it, know what happened there. It was but, it was uh, COVID that put paid to that. It might have been yes, might have been. I don't know because it, there was no follow up. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, um, Come, it's not been. But I don't mind that. I mean, it's been done. <laughs> it's been done often enough, you know. Um, there's still another. There's another. There's a German. Um, performance coming up next year oh really um yes a big german performance now where is it um where is it ansbach ansbach yes yes there's the agreement yes yeah is it is it part of a festival or is it a one um, show do you know that? I, I think it's an, a one-off oh, special okay, okay. Uh, I don't know. You, you you might be able to to in, investigate that one. Yeah, it's not till not September in two thousand and twenty four. <laughs> I see. Okay. Good. Uh, yes. How often? But, do uh, people... but, uh, yeah. Go on. Oh, you oh you first, please. No, I have not. No, <laughs> no, I was going to say. I think it's been done enough, but it'll obviously get done, you know, be, when I say done enough, I mean performed again. Um, I think it will probably be performed again around, you know. Mm-hmm. But, it, but I think the main, things move on, everything moves on. Although of course the young, come back. The young people really, I've... I've been re-engaged with, I mean, granted, music academia is its own little, you know, hothouse, right? So, but I've, I've known many musicians through the years who've said specifically that they would love to play. I knew a cellist in grad, graduate school who said, oh, I'd love that solo. I'd love to play it. I've known brass players who've been interested in it. So I think, uh, I don't know if it makes you wince to imagine becoming part of the standard repertoire, <laughs> but I think it is. No, it no, is no, part- that's, that's fine. No, that's fine. I mean, Amazing, mm-hmm. fine. Doesn't bother me, you know. You could say money art for art's sake, money for Christ's sake. Because mm-hmm. um, I get, I would be, I get a little bit of the royalties as well, well which helps. I had an interesting and kind of provocative thought, which is that we've had all these court cases. Uh, you know, the the one with Robin Thicke and Marvin Gaye. All these people going back and forth about what constitutes a composition and I, I know you signed a bunch of pieces of paper with Pink Floyd back at the time as one does but you know if we imagine a world where all of them vanished right and I was thinking about this usually the definition of a of a song in the popular music world is the melody plus the lyrics right the chords are not usually seen as copyrightable and I thought to myself well god like on those terms Adam Hart Mother is yours right <laughs> sort of free and clear as it were I mean I realized that of course you were working on top of the band's chord structure and 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 and, and form but as sort of a a little provocative thought I had as well. That's you know that is your piece. No, no, no. Yeah. Well, you you. <laughs> in in copyright terms, to, I mean to, play, playfully. Yeah. A, no, 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 no. To coin a phrase <laughs> used in uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, um, you no, actually it's not that. It's a sequel to that. Um, you might say that, but I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> No, 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 no. It was a joint. Listen, no. Read the read the last chapter. It's a Mm. joint, totally joint. It's a It's a a time shifted dialogue. Right. Right. You get somebody does something at, 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 at one point in time, and someone else comes along and and puts a bit more. It's a. Isn't it a bit like? Uh, you know, I don't know if you you know that the, that paper drawing game consequences where you you draw a head and you fold the paper, and it's a ch- children's 
game. You, you draw the, a human head and fold the paper and then the next person does the body drawing and folds that. So you, each person does not see what has been done and then you, at the end you, uh, you, you, you outfold the paper, fold out the paper and see that in a very hum, you know, extremely crazy cartoon of, of a, a body. Um, it's like that, mm. I think, yeah. <laughs> on one level, on one level. There are many levels. And music is a conversa is sort of always a conversation too, isn't it? I mean, you know, we hear, I don't know, somebody like Mozart, let's say, or Beethoven responding to something, you know, and the people who came before them. Or we hear, for that matter, you know, uh, Charlie Parker or Sonny Rollins or any number of other people playing a solo and what they play is a response in, in part. It draws on all the music they've ever heard and it's kind of a conversation of with people who came before them or their yeah, contemporaries. Yeah, so you get to, I, don't, I don't know if that would apply to Wagner, mind you. I think, <laughs> no, this is how it will be. You will... <laughs> this is it. I have stated it. <laughs> uh, the Gesamtkunstwerk, where he has control over every parameter uh, of everything that's yeah, happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but again, if uh, uh, one of my other uh, oft trotted, fra uh, trotted out phrases is, you, "You do what you can get away with in mm -hmm. life, in life, in composing," and that it's a fair way of of, of going in life. Because you're testing yourself against the world, and if the world agrees, you live. <laughs> if the world doesn't, you die. Yeah. That's it. Do you? Go on. Yeah. Do you get? Um, how often do you get requests for the score and parts to Adam Hart Mother? How often do? Um, do... Before COVID, <laughs> BC before COVID, <laughs> and a, a, a C after COVID. Uh, BC, I don't know about maybe four or five a year, but before COVID, but since COVID, I think there's just actually just one. Well, no, wow. there, actually, there have been inquiries, but because I don't want it, well, and the Floyd, Pink Floyd music publishers uh, don't want it to just be done by anybody you know and r wrecked or mm -hmm. you know abused in any way it's a fair f uh, quite a fee to f to hire the score mm -hmm. and that stops of people unless they're really you know unless it's a high profile performance so there have been a few inquiries but the people have not it's been a bit too on the, uh, too amateur Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't want to, it to go out to just anybody. And yeah. also, there have been um, PhD students wanting to study it, <laughs> for, you know, write, write stuff about it. Uh, and they've I mean, wanted to, uh... they've wanted to, the, to look at the score, obviously. But I say, well, no, I can't, I can't let it, because that it'll just leak across the world. Be, and the reason is it's, it was never published, you know, it was never printed pub, as a published work. So it's only in manuscript. Oh, yeah, uh, it's tot totally, I'm sorry, it's totally understandable from the Pink Floyd management to uh, not uh, want to have it butchered. But to be honest, I mean, Pink Floyd butchered it themselves quite a few times in 1970 and 71 so ah, but that, yeah, ah, that, that's different well i think yes yes don't remind me um <laughs> oh, sorry well, yes well you're doing you have reminded me sorry I, I know perfectly well um <laughs> yes but that it was the best they could do and i mean what's not stated in the book really is that the the result of my um, aggression towards the, the the mouthy horn player in the Abbey Road studios than where I was about to hit him 
um, and I was removed to the upstairs to the the control room. John Aldis, the choir master, took over. Well, you, we know that. Um, that's stated. But what's not been stated is that John Aldis didn't have a clue about that kind of music. He, he didn't have a clue about rock, and I think he had even less of a clue about what I've said about the idea of, of the brass play. I wanted it to be a kind of a hot, uh, slightly ahead of the beat, not behind it. And he was a choir conductor, a classical choir conductor. Very floaty, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so uh, some of the the catastrophes, I have to say, were due to his lack of of tight knowledge of the the medium, <laughs> and the medium, of course, had just been created by Pink Floyd and me. <laughs> it, the, the medium didn't really exist before, so they had to work out a way of <laughs> getting on the stage and getting off uh, alive. You know, so it, it, that was a that was a pity. Uh, the pity. Uh, was that I could not conduct. I had no tra no training and no, no, you know, from where I where I came from, I had no training, so I couldn't. Con and that, but if I had, obviously, I would have had uh, command of the medium. Right. Have you ever listened to the performances? You, you mentioned in the book that you, in the process of writing the book, you went back and you listened to a few performances that the band did before you came together and work on, worked on it so that you could hear the kind of skeletal form they had going and, and the compositional elements that they were playing live in the months before they gave you the work tape. Have you ever listened to the performances from the following year after Jeffrey Mitchell took over the baton? Um, and d if so, did you no. find any? Oh, okay. No. There, there are a few. No. It'd be interesting yeah, to see he, what he actually he would. I I remember him, I, I I knew him, um. Then another nice chap. <laughs> um, no, I haven't. I haven't. No, but I don't need to really. I've done mm -hmm. that. I've got you know. I'm, <laughs> I've I've done as you know hundreds of other things, and I'm still doing things. I'm in fact at this in. The, at this moment, not this week, for instance, I'm restructuring material that I did for TV children's um, maths series in, in 1980, 1981, uh, digitizing and and moving you know moving things about and, and discovering a lot of stuff that I did subconsciously I never heard again and mm -hmm. I'm far more interested in all that than listening to <laughs> Adam and Mother again because I know what you know it's there you know I think that no there was a very good performance um I don't, some I think it's on the net somewhere Last year, the the top Italian tribute band, Pink Floyd Legend, asked me to go to Rome because they were starting a tour and and they wanted to climax the event with uh, Atom Heart Mother, and they wanted me to be there on the first night and uh, I you know play a bit of background piano and and strike the strings with mallets and caress etc and uh, um, 2,500 audience and, uh, and that was great fun so I've heard it again last year <laughs> right in the middle I was sitting in the middle of it <laughs> it, was a, it was a good performance anyway there you go could we talk maybe a little bit about music from the body um, uh, yeah. that's a 
I've I've seen that documentary. It's it's really quite remarkable, actually. It's still very bracing, you know, even in, I think I watched it maybe five years ago with my wife. And even in the 21st century, it's still, it's quite, um, it seems to me quite humane and also quite unsparing. You know, in other words, it tells tells the truth, but it also has a kind of humanity to it and a kind of uh, compassion that I think comes through. Um, uh -huh. yeah. But you... You worked on that alongside Roger Waters, and and it seems like the two of you worked sort of in parallel rather than in collaboration. He would he would do the song bits, and and you would do the. Um, that's correct. Yes. And um, that's one of you know many many sound, soundtracks I know that you've done. Um, so there are certain elements in that that I hear resurfacing over and over again in your music, at least at the time. Oh, uh, for instance, you know, mandolin style tremolos seem to be something yeah. that 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 come up a great deal. Um, yeah. Do you have do you have fond memories of that project? Was that something that you know brings a smile when you think about it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's nothing. Uh, there's nothing there. Nothing there that I would take away. Um, of course, the music to the film, the film soundtrack. Yeah, Roger and I did work. Just worked completely separately. Um, after agreeing which sections needed songs and which sections needed my atmospheres. Um, and um, what happened? Uh, yeah, his songs were on the, the, the film, ha were necessarily rough because he, he didn't have much time. He was just working in his own little studio and when the EMI decided that they would make the music from the body, which is the album, um, we he remade all his songs, so they're all different, or the take you could say take the takes versions are different, where whereas my mine were exactly as I had done it on the film. And then we we added two pieces on the album that got nothing to do with the film, the the opening of side one and the opening of side two, where it was just us having that, being friends and having fun. That's um, the one with all the you know various er ericitations, shall we call them? Yeah, to use the <laughs> yes, no, that's a very, a very technical term, which I know. <laughs> burping, burping. <laughs> yes, among other things. Yes. 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 Um, and uh, the the body, the movement of a of a a body, a sleeping body. <laughs> uh, I think that was Roger's idea to 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 try and move a sleeping body in a sound piece, <laughs> and we just did it. You know. That was the period where he... like a couple of removal men with a with a, <laughs> a with a cabinet saying a little bit left a bit right a bit up there okay John uh, well yes and um, and then the last piece on side two it, it's the the Floyd uh, plus me on piano right good... that's right yeah give birth to a smile isn't it called that's right yeah mm -hmm. yeah I mean that's not too generally known because mm -hmm. it couldn't be stated but mm -hmm. it's they were they were all there mm -hmm. they turned up you know? mm -hmm. yeah and that was a period where you've mentioned that roger began kind of grousing about how he wanted to leave the band or yeah i mean he, he knew mm -hmm. as you put it I, th I think at one point which you know where his bread was buttered but and i in rereading that i wondered if you had any sense of what what was the music that he wanted to write that he couldn't Right with the band, did he want to go off and do sort of overtly political things? Um, and felt I don't know, okay, I don't know. Yeah, it would seem, I think, from what you've said just now, mm -hmm. you've worked out, <laughs> <laughs> you've worked out what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. he's, yeah, yeah, I think it's just sort yes, of hard. It, it, oh, go on, it, 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 yeah, it's kind of obvious. The political thing emerged, you know, I hate that, I hate it, I can't stand all that. Mm -hmm. no, I'm not interested. I think it's awful. <laughs> Any political comment is awful because politicians aren't worth a shit. <laughs> As my guru deceased 
said, uh, Lin Yu Tang uh, from New York, he was a Chinese, born in China, lived in New York, worked in New York uh, through the 1930s and 40s. He said, all politicians are drawn from the ranks of the mediocracy. <laughs> that's a great line. And that's that. that that's it. Is that, so if anyone's deciding to mess about with politics, let them go and and do it, but stay out of my road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. One more, one more Roger question. I just wonder, yeah. he had this routine that he would go into, um, and I wonder if you've ever heard him do it, where he would imitate a Scotsman. Um, there was this thing on Amagama yes. called... Yeah, I mean, yes. yeah. What, what what did you think of it? Did you did you did you find it funny? Did you did it did it's it? It's all right. I can do better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's right now. Come on, I saw I do that. Hey, all right, son. Um, the reason there's a straight reason. I thought this had been stated before, but anyway, Roger's mother was Scottish. Oh no! Wait a minute. She, either, she was either Scottish or half Scottish, so she. I think she had a, something of a Scottish accent, so he. That was his, his breaking into, uh, you know, Scot Scottish ranting, uh, is a direct connection, to, mm -hmm. to, his mother. That was something that Stephen used to do during our composition lessons too, by the way. So it's sort of, it's oh, right. my, my old teacher, Stephen uh, Siegel. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Partic particularly well, when I'm... I needed to be put back on the straight and narrow, he would, as suddenly the Scottish yeah. accent would come out because his mother was Scottish. Ah, right, right. Now, I, I'm, uh, I have been working on an examination of Scottish monologists, which is a forgotten area of verbal delivery um, and I've collected record. I mean this is all in the 1920s and 30s so I've collected quite a few records of that of these people in that period and there's some wonderfully vicious satirical um, comments in, within them about the whole Glasgow um, life the, um, people in Glasgow and it's not confined to Glasgow the, the, the condition of trying to be superior uh, trying to having been brought up in a tenement in a very low low class situation trying to appear a little bit posher a bit bigger and, and uh, and people and using long long words and getting them wrong and it's a lot of it hilarious but nobody now knows about this stuff and I've collected this enormous bunch of information and and there's nowhere to go with it I can't I'm not going to start writing the book because there's no I can't put it anywhere but that's another thing anyway Speaking of books, by the way, you, our listeners might not know, you are, as I understand it, a collector of adjustable, over here we would call them wrencher, wrenches, you but do. over there you call them spanners. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, and, that's uh, right. What, well, I was, what, I, I, yes, go on. Oh, no, what, 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 what do you think, is it, is it their tactile qualities or their visual qualities, or what about them do you find beguiling? It, it's the... It was because I'm completely spannered out now, um, having written two book the two <laughs> two books on the history and development of the adjustable spanner. Um, it's the it, the only connection to creativity and and uh, and art is the incredible almost infinite ways that the human being has devised to grip and turn the humble nut the the design problems and, and, and inventing 
inventors inventing problems <laughs> to solve, to turn the humble nut. That's what appealed to me, the, the, the crazy mechanism, crazy mechan the, the absurdity of, of mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, to do, that's what it's to do with. It was, it mm -hmm. was. I'm now seeking to place the collection, some 3,000 <laughs> uh, adjustable spanners. Engla the term in, or the colloquial term in Germany is Englander, an Englander. Um, because it, uh, they, they were first created in England Bef uh, before the Industrial Revolution feeding into the Industrial but um, I've done it now I've done it so I'm, I'm seeking to place the collection but there isn't anywhere to place it <laughs> this is typical of me because uh, uh, museums most museums don't have any space and they certainly don't have any money because I wouldn't I'd like a few a few pounds for <laughs> for 35 years of work and collecting things anyway uh, it, it doesn't matter uh, they're sitting there now they'll yeah, go no. somewhere I mean, I think it makes an intuitive kind of sense to me because there's a way, at least for me, in which composing is sort of the act of figuring out the dimensions of a problem and then solving it, right? And sort of f figuring out the way in which, in our case, I guess, you know, time and, and space, as it were, intersect and how um, one of the things I find so frustrating about many of these computer notation programs is that they, uh, the bad ones make it hard to move ideas around in time. And mm -hmm. there's a kind of spatial, you know, circling back to what we were talking about earlier with Varese. I mean, his music is so mm -hmm. spatial. It's like these giant shapes sort of in the air that get reiterated and moved around. And it's their relationship mm -hmm. feels almost architectural. So it yeah. makes a kind of sense I, to me. I agree. Yeah. Now what, the, the piece you haven't mentioned by Varese, which I must mention, and that is Poem Electronique, mm -hmm. because that was the finest piece it might still be the finest piece of electronic music composition I've ever heard mm -hmm. and that was done in 1950 56 57 uh, for the Brussels exposition mm -hmm. and Le Corbusier designed the structure for the, the Phillips pavilion yeah mm -hmm. I, I think it was in Eindhoven well it was, it was Phillips, multi channel so wasn't it in Eindhoven hmm? It was multi-channel in some way, right? I don't remember how many channels they had going. Yes, they it had... was. That's right. Yeah, and they, 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 he he devised them, or in in collaboration with the Philips engineers, a, a multi-speaker system where you, you instead you couldn't pan something up a wall, you just moved it through fifty speak. I don't know how many speakers, but there's a whole book about it and mm -hmm. diagrams and. It was they used a switching system, so they switched the sound from speaker to speaker up a wall, many lines of speakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh no, it, that 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 in advance of, it, of its time certainly. But it, I'm I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about the comp looking at looking at listening to the composition, mm -hmm. the structure, the the, the you know, in space, in time anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Come on. More questions. Are sure. We, we're getting there. We're getting there. Oh, absolutely. Because um, <laughs> I'll be. I've got to. In a quarter of an hour, I've got to go for a pint of beer. Oh yeah. Well, we, 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 Good. Far be it for me to get in between. You know, <laughs> you no. and your and your pint. Believe me. Um, <laughs> You, you mentioned in the book that you or uh, I, mean, no, I don't think it's in the book. Actually, I think it's in an interview you did recently that you would have loved to have done a big science fiction film of the right kind at some point. Yeah. Uh, and our listeners probably, um, many of our listeners probably know that Pink Floyd actually were in talks at one point to do Dune uh, before uh, with uh, Alejandro, uh, let me make sure I pronounce this correctly, Hodorowski, I think is how they pronounce his name. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll it's, leave it's, that to you. Yeah, <laughs> I, had to, I had to look it up. Um, so uh, is that something you'd still, I mean, I, I realize, of course, that especially a feature length film would be a gigantic commitment. But is that still something that that piques your oh, interest? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. In fact, a lot of this stuff that I'm, uh, I'm discovering through this, the, 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 these 1980s um, 
uh, short, very short pieces for, for these maths and science programs. Uh, there's loads of stuff in there that are just, it's just what I, do, what I was doing. Um, if, and there's a, there's an album of a film, uh, the film music that I did called Ghost Story in 1974 and that's coming out next year it should have come out three years ago but Covid stopped it mm -hmm. that's on Trunk Records and he's he's actually doing the doing this um, maths one next yeah no I could do it I could do it but how I would do it at, at my now at my advanced age with a bit less um, energy is I'd, 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 I think I would probably get a small team up and I would I would direct that team that would be the way to do it I would sit in it I would get a very comfortable chair because <laughs> so it's doing it, it. Cause, yeah 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 uh, uh, yes definitely yeah anyway I, I would hope that yeah. you wouldn't do it in a poorly air conditioned attic you know with blasting heat and, and fans <laughs> no, no. Yeah, with, no, with your no, shirt no, off no. No, no chance of that. Although you see, <laughs> what is it? Depri deprivation up to a point pr produces work. You know, pr mm -hmm. produces energy. Mm -hmm. um, if you if things are too easy, it, everything gets a bit soft. The, 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 the thinking gets soft. The the timing gets soft. The the, the the moment of you know the right moment mm -hmm. no you know, that gets you miss the, the the essential timing of things so there's a there's a, that's to be considered yes yeah that gets into you talk a lot about art and craft in the book and about you know how both of them are really part of what any composer and, and certainly it sounds like for you thinking about the idea of both of them as disciplines, both of them as a kind of devotion, you know, devotional, maybe that's the wrong word for it, but something, you know, something that one brings to mind, not in the moment of creation, because that's happening more at the subconscious level, I think, but as, as parts of what you do, um, you know, so that as to something I say to my students sometimes, it's like, you know, if you wait to be inspired, you'll be waiting a long time. Uh, oh, there yeah. are times. Yeah. 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 I know that connecting with that, um, what I th I've said is um, that even when you're feeling low and nothing's happening and the phone's not ringing or the, the computer's not bleeping at you your mobile's stopped and all the rest of it you have to keep doing just turning the cogs over so that when a, a big demand comes unexpectedly you've got the mechanism you the technique ready to do and and therefore uh, more importantly to satisfy yourself because if you if you're rusty and you try to do something and, f and fail you go into you in fact that is one of the reasons why there's so much depression about is that that, that uh, people are not ready to think about something and they're put in a position where they have to do something and they can't and they they sue themselves they persecute themselves and and start a whirlpool there's millions of there's millions of them in the world millions mm -hmm. i often find that young people think that they're supposed to have some sort of grand plan and I try to tell them that, at least in my life, it's been much more useful to try to acquire as much skill and as many different things as possible whenever I can, and to be as flexible and open-minded as I can. And that's gotten me so many more opportunities than having any kind of a plan, because life happens, you know, all kinds of yeah. unexpected things. Yeah, happen. yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. I think we're in agreement. <laughs> well, good. I'll, I'll... You, <laughs> what a perfect way to stand to, to, end, to end this podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh well Nils did you have anything more you want to ask or shall we shall we wrap things no, up so I'm, that Ron can I'm, have his pint I think I'm heated no, no, don't worry about that that's, fle that's flexible 
<laughs> no, no. No, I'm good. I'm perfectly fine. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, it's been a pleasure awesome. and a privilege. It's been a pleasure and a privilege talking with you. Um, oh, th and, well, thank you. Th thank you, because you have genned up, as we say, on the subject <laughs> and, uh, and most uh, eloquently put over thank from you. your point, from, uh, you know, from what I could see of you, and what I've heard of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ron. I thank you, everybody. Right. Thank yes. you. No, thank you. you know, <laughs> no, that, we're that does. A, we're all doing a, do a Groucho Marx now. Oh, thank, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay. And and Bye. to our listeners, we'll just take one moment and say thank you all for listening. Uh, listeners who are presumably listening at this moment, please subscribe to the Finkelskate podcast to make sure that you can easily tune in to our upcoming episodes. And for now, goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.